the Constitution of 1982, as most of you must know. So a, tri a tribute to him and a tribute to his son who, take, who took on the, the court case when his father passed away. I also wish to say for my cousin, Cassandra Batmalet, who is fighting uh, cancer, a word for her as well. <clears throat> okay, that being said, because I've made a promise to her, so she's, she's, she's going to run chemo, so it's hard for her, and she's, she's uh, doing the real fight right now, so her <coughs> hearts are with her. The objectives of today, offer an early descriptions of Acadie MBT, which is a hot topic, and we're gonna get there. Discuss, the light in li discuss this in lights of palliate facts and key principles. And then this refers to, you know, a talk that has been around, I think, a month and a half ago where Dr. Uh, Adam Goodry came from uh, Saskatoon, uh, came here and said that Acadia Métis were basically in the wrong of calling themselves Métis because the only Métis that there is are Red River Métis. You know, he came here to, to, to suggest those thoughts. And um, to basically say to the Acadia Métis that they were using a wrong image for themselves and a wrong identity. Uh, I was called after that to make a, a counter narrative to that, to express that, which I'm going to revisit a bit today in a boosted terms. Uh, essentially, the arguments can relate back to his friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Chris Adam Anderson, Chris Anderson, that presents this vision in a book that you can read for yourself, which is that book, Michi. Hello, welcome. Please come in. Sorry. Um, in this book, uh, essentially, Chris Anderson presents his doctrines that uh, Métis word, the moniker, should be reserved only for the Red River Métis because basically only these people had uh, a density of population that went through a political crisis and moments of resistance that allowed their cohesion to be. And so because of that, the word Métis uh, should only apply to them as a name of a tribe, for example, if you would talk of the Cherokee, for example, or other nations. So the word should be there alone, theirs alone. And other people that don't subscribe to this philosophy are accused of appropriation or to um, to be uh, you know melange or mixed about their own identities and culture. So there is a lot of tension in the air in, in terms of that doctrine, and I will go through that I hope extensively in that presentation today, where I'm going to show from uh, the Pauli case that the same argument that Dr. Anderson is presenting in his book were used by the Crown in the Pauli court case to try to sabotage the Métis, okay? So essentially, uh, and I'm gonna show evidence to that if I can, or else you can email me and ask me for those evidence. I share them plenty on my Twitter account as well. So uh, basically, I, I show that uh, Mr. Pauli, the Crown, you know, in his, his memorandum, when they went to the Supreme Court and appealing, they were saying, are you kidding me? Pauli is 164 Indian. And his son, it's even worse, right? So that blood quantum deluding um, arguments, as well as one more thing that is very interesting in that memorandum that people don't read, right? It's that the Crown state, look, we've treated Miti from an individual perspective for 300 years. Wow, the Crown admits to that, right? They admit that they are dealing with Miti people all across Canada, if you read the Bago report, for example, in Lower Canada, you will see a differential treatment of the Miti there, per evidence, not my opinion. And you will see that Miti are treated on an individual basis because they are all across the land through the French-Indian relationship. But furthermore, that's also an argument that the Crown suggested in Pauli while going to the Supreme Court, that's way, way back when, to say, we don't own them a thing. They are not forming any collective. And indigenous rights are collective for their basis. Hence, if they don't have collectivities, we don't hand, we don't hold them squatly. Do we don't, you know, we don't have to give them rights. So basically, they say too deluded, too white, not consistent in their affirmations. Because when you go through the family of the Paoli, you understand through senses that they self-identified as French Canadian, as white, as German one place as an Indian. Their records were all over the place according to, you know, probably their survival tactics through Wisconsin, Michigan, and Sault Ste. Marie. 
When you put all this picture together, the crown was tapping hard on that. These are not pure, these are not Métis, and these are certainly not a people. And what my argument is today, if I can summarize it, because I'm sure I'm going to miss time, but I want to say that, that to you now, is that that argument is now used by our own against Métis. The same argument that the crown used to destroy the Pauli case is now used by academics that are asking other Métis, where's your people? Well, our people has been sabotaged for 300 years. What are you talking about? Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Oh, the word Métis only belongs to us. Really? Well, I have quotes in here from elders from Alberta that says exactly the opposite. That said that they used to call themselves Canadien and half breed and all kinds of terms. And that the terms Métis was only used politically very recently. And that is in Alberta by Elder Gary Ladouceur that I'm saluting today. See, here's the thing. Once you know the traditions and you visit people on the ground, like I did two weeks ago, I was in Regina, Red River, Marawa. When you meet people from their families, above and beyond the abstractiveness of academic work today, that tries to just, you know, impose a meta language of nationalisms that would be pure and fair and one language, one there, it doesn't work like that. We know that from our traditions. But there's so much violence right now in the, in the academic milieu. There's so much discrimination for a word that this madness, in my opinion, has to stop. And it has to stop because it leads to different politics, okay? This is the argument reashed from Chris Anderson that essentially says that if you don't have this peoplehood consciousness as a sociologist as he is, you don't have a claim for a peoplehood. Government was saying the same to the MET, which the Supreme Court basically rejected. Right? They rejected all of these arguments because the Pauli and the Supreme Court won the argument, right? So, early description of the Academici, because a lot of people say, well, that's fair for you, Sebastian, in the Great Lakes and whatnot in the fear trade, but here in Acadia, there's only two people, the Acadian and the Mi'kmaq. They either went Mi'kmaq or they went Acadia. So I call this kind of a dual, dualistic logic that excludes the middle, right? Well, we have a lot of evidence that to show, and I'm going to go quickly through them. If you still, you know, if you want them, please ask me. But the common knowledge quote, right? This little quote here that suggests that the Acadian, the people are tall and well-proportionate, good on you guys, as I told before. They delight much in, in waving long hair. They are of dark complexion in general and sometimes of the mixture of the Indian. But they are some of light complexion. They retain their language and custom of their neighbor, the French, with a mixed affectation with the, uh, of the native Indians. See here, there's kind of a, there, for outsider watcher, for people that looks at them, they're like kind of both, right? It shows distinctiveness. Not quite Indian, not quite French. What's going on in here? Then you say this quote. A lot of people, you know, are mulattoes with Indian blood. The same. This quote is from 1879, right? Primaries. People describing them way back when. That is prior Pauli and all that politics, right? So I'm going quickly here because I know we're going to miss time. But here's important arguments for La Hebe. Okay? Here's a quote saying that there's a body of people in La Hebe, Nova Scotia, that are described as Métis. Okay? Me and here, look. Cabouche and Métis from La Hebe, under one Le Jeune Dibriard Courier des Bois. Evidence from 1895. And that's a judge, Justice Debray, that writes the history of Lindenburg, right? You have Bois Brule used and Métis used in Rameau that describe the Acadie Métis of La Hebe as forming even a people, a small people, a community. So you have primary evidence, and my case is that most of those primary evidence were not introduced to court properly. They were never produced. I mean, people are saying, well, Métis Acadien, they all lost in court. Yeah, they did. Like the Pauli faced problems as well in the primary courts, you know, in the first courts. They did, but they never, perhaps, and that's my opinion, had a very strong case presented forward. 
Okay. <laughs> right? And we have a mixed breed letter from Monsieur de la Varenne to a friend in La Rochelle who says, who describes this. Ask your question, sir, about the English being on the right or wrong in their treatments of the Acadien. Let me describe to you what are the Acadians for him. They were a mixed breed. That is to say, most of them proceeded from marriage concubinage with a savage woman in their first settler. A lot of people will say to me, Sebastian, you're racist. Because it's only about mixing breed now. You're not talking about culture. You're not talking about peoplehood. You know, I'm serious, guys. You're not talking about something that makes a people a people. You're making this a racist land, and you're stealing the Red River Thunder by taking the name Métis. Right? It's also about culture. It's also about culture because people were treated differently because of those names. Half-breed and Miti, when you were described as such, you were treated differently by the British that were, according to primary evidence against, hunted down, scalped, and killed, just like the Mi'kmaq. You were treated really differently, even according to Sigon. You know Father Sigon, he wrote about the Acadia and all that, according to primaries. Again, I don't have time to show it all of them, but I will share them with you gladly, and including in articles that are coming. Father Sigon says there's a lot of prejudice against the mixed blood and the people that have Indian blood in Acadia. He stated that right in the open. There's a discrimination in place with anything that touched to Indians. Now, you will say to me, I don't believe you still, Sebastian, you're full of it. You don't take a shower, you're not pretty, you're not nice. <laughs> a lot of this on Twitter right now, right? <laughs> you're, you're, against, you're against women, you're against... I heard it all, right? I heard it all in one week, okay? But here, okay, let me just present a few, a few cases here. Look at that, you, you, the screen, if you can capture it. These are a newspaper article that goes back 1886. Not my opinions. In those news articles, there are six news articles at least, that described the Métis Acadien per name in Taspespiac, revolting against famine. They have no more food. They are describing these newspapers that you can, sh you can gladly read them for yourself and base your own opinion. They are suggesting that the Métis, are, the Métis Acadien are, from, are different, are distinct from the French, from the Anglo of that time, and from the Mi'kmaq. And they form collectivities even with chiefs that tries to riot in order to survive. These are described point blank as primary evidence. Now some people will say to me, Sebastian, even there you're not right. We need an affidavit of Miti Akkadian that says, I'm a Miti, to, in order to have proof and right thing that their self-consciousness was Miti. I'm saying back to these guys, are you kidding me? You're talking about fishermen and people living in the bush trying to survive. You think that they will go around and say, I'm going to write for Chris Anderson a little paper here that says I'm a METI forever? <laughs> <laughs> you really think that's what's going to happen? Right? I mean, it perhaps, perhaps it did happen for Louis Riel because he wrote about the METI. And what he wrote about the METI is this. There is Métis in the eastern province of Canada. Riel himself wrote it so in 1885, with equal rights. When I presented that quote in a side conversation with Dr. Anderson, he said to me, if you, want, if you wish to rely so much on that single quote, you try to go ahead and publish it. Or we are, I mean, I'm looking for people to have a pleasant conversation and constructive and healing conversation about these issues. You know, more article here that shows it. I came loaded, guys, in terms of evidence, right? Because people, they don't, they just don't believe me. Meaty fishermen in, pa in Paspispiak describe it as shady, re re you know, rebellious. So, Basically, I'm just glancing along here to find new arguments, okay? And I'm going to deliver just a few more arguments here just for, for us having fun. What, why should we police Miti ethnonyms? Why should we go all fuzzy about this when we can be just a little bit more precise about how do we use the term? Why should we be a little bit more frantic about this? For example, when 30 different ethnonyms were used in Red River alone. 30 different ethnonyms. Why would you pick only the term Miti and bang it? 
Is it because it is now in the Constitution of Canada, and by you know securing the term, you may secure money and political privilege? Is that the question? Right? I mean, I don't know. I would love to hear it. But here's the thing. Here's a quote from 1879, primary evidence. The designation of French. What is that Métis, you guys? The designation of French is often indifferentially applied to Canadian Métis of all race and even pure Indians who associate with Métis and speak their patois. So these guys in Red River, this is in Red River, were not even called Métis for that quote. They weren't called French. So you try to reinvent history and go back there and says that only French applied to Red Why? Whoa, it doesn't stick. It doesn't stick with historical evidence and it doesn't stick with our oral traditions. That says that there were Métis, half-braid, bois brûlé, all across the land, right? When some older guys like, you know, Gary, yesterday, said to me, look, Sebastian, I, I lived in Alberta and in settlement. I'm a old Métis. Right? I'm an old half breed, he called himself. I've never used the term Michi. Until politically, some people said that I needed to. I speak to the family of Robert Pilon as well, and from Batash, my friends. He said to me, We never used the term Michi when we were kids. We were part Indians or other names, and we were discriminated against that for that term. <coughs> and now they want to reinvent that word. That's fine. You want to take that word back for your culture? Yes. We real call it for it. He said, now, if you have Indian ancestry or First Nations ancestry, as he used to say, and European, you put them together, and you proudly call yourself Métis, becoming culture for it, good for you, said Louis Riel in his writing. So I'm saying good for everybody that wants to go down that road. Just don't block other people that wish to do so as well. That's all what I'm saying. And in order to further peace about it, Let's make sure that we know our own distinctions about it. Like, for example, Red River Métis, right? That's another quote for another elder. And that's the quote from Ruriel, if you don't believe me. When it comes to the eastern province of Canada, Métis, many Métis live there persecuted under the attire of Indian costumes. Their village, our village of indigence, their Indian title to the soil is, however, as good as the Indian title of Métis of Manitoba. Clear distinction, right? He knows the people from Manitoba. He knows that people from Eastern <coughs> Provinces because he traveled there. No problem for him. Who will now accuse Louis Riel of not knowing what Miti were? <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm just... Because that, that's what I was challenged. Alright, so I'm just going to conclude here with the Pauli thing, okay? Because I know I'm way over time. I'm sorry, Nisha. I'm, 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 I'm a bad boy like that. Um, Pauli and its interpretations. Okay. So basically, I've told you that prior to that, we have an issue, we have a problem, right? So here's the quote for those who don't believe me. This is from the appeal from the Crown, looking for going after the Pali and discredit them. The respondent, Steve Pauli, is 164 Ojibwe ancestry, and his son, the respondent, Rodney Pauli, is 128 Indian blood. So they are applying blood quantum here to show, to see that these guys are white men. They're white privileging passing people. And you know what? Now there's people in Red River, a few nationalistic people that will say, yeah, they are. You know? And then the, the here, here's the second argument. The only historic recognition of person of mixed heritage, heritage sorry, as a separate category occurred after a confederation in the Northwest Canada due to its size and political development, the Métis society centered at Red River gained colonial recognition as a distinct category of people. Yes. Yes, it did happen at Red River, but not exclusively. And this language that you have to be political on paper or else you're not an indigenous society was used by the Crown to hurt the Paoles and hurt the Métis. Yet that language is used now by a few nationalistic scholars and organizations to weed off the other Métis. Same language. I would argue same lateral violence. And finally, this is the individualistic treatment, right? Similarly, the Métis of Sault Ste. Marie were not permitted to participate in Robinson treaties as a people. Their participation was as individuals. You have it. What I am told by other Métis from different people is this. You're not a Métis, you're maybe a mixed heritage person. But you don't deserve to be called, calling yourself a people 
and you don't deserve to be part of the people. Now I'm saying this is highly problematic. They use the same argument, the same colonial logic that tried to destroy our people for 300 years. And now it is rehashed and recast into those process. I'm suggesting that this language has to go. We have to find other ways in which to speak to one another in respect of our difference, in respect of our vulnerabilities, in respect of resilience. And I would strongly encourage our Mi'kmaq friends not to fall for that doctrines. There is possibility to collaborate and to revive the possibility of old alliances between Akademichi and Mi'kmaq people around culture, around sharing, around mutual understanding. I'm sure of that. I've speak to both to some people on both sides right now. And that's what I hope that this presentation, which you know I just ran through, hopefully will bring to fore. I thank you very much for your time and for your listening.